The latest research in genetics says genes don't create disease. It's the environment that signals the gene that creates, that creates change. Well, if the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion, the moment you embrace an elevated emotion, you're signaling the gene ahead of the environment. Now, what do genes do? Genes make proteins. And what are proteins responsible for? The structure or function of your body. And the expression of proteins is the expression of life. And if you keep knocking on that genetic door over and over again, you're going to begin to upregulate the genes for health, and you're going to downregulate the genes for disease. And all of a sudden, you're going to wake up in your dream and realize that you're a different person. I think, you know, we'll have to step out of the realm of biology and into the realm of physics. I mean, the body is always emitting light and information. It's just every cell in the body, you know, emits energy and light. So if a person is at negative and frustrated and they're... And you feel that. You, you, you can feel, feel it. it. So you have your waves working with their waves and they cancel out and you feel that destructive interference. But if we're have sharing the same energy, and our energy unifies and it creates bigger waves and it's, it's constructive and we feel connected and, and, and that's healthy. And, and I think that many people shut that off, but um, I think that we're innately uh, sensitive to energy. We were teaching people how to heal other people. Now, there was research done at Yale University back in the 40s by this uh, great scientist named Harold Saxton Burr. And what Burr was interested in was studying the electromagnetic fields around things. Mm -hmm. So he started with all kinds of different eggs, like salamander eggs, lizard eggs, chicken eggs, bird eggs. And what he noticed was that every single time, the most positive, strongest charge was always where the head was, yeah. and the weakest charge was always where the tail was. And he noticed that there was this invisible electromagnetic field, like a magnet, surrounding the organism. So then he said, okay, that's 100% of the time. So then he started studying rodents that had a proclivity for uterine cancer. And what he noticed was that every single rodent had the same electromagnetic signature that had the cancer, 100% of the time. But here's the cool part. There were rodents that didn't have the cancer, but had the signature in the field. And every single one of them ultimately developed the cancer. Huh. That means that it's not matter that emits a field. It's the field that creates matter change the field to change, change matter. matter. So we take a group of people, we call it the cage. People come that have health conditions, they lay on the floor. Now our students have been working all week uh, this long. This is at a workshop. Yeah, they're connecting. They spend the whole okay. week. They're getting better, they're getting more refined, they're creating more coherence. It only requires them to get beyond their body, get beyond their environment, and get beyond time. And they connect to that quantum field and we teach them how to lay a coherent signature in the field of the person laying there. Once they do? I have seen tumors disappear. I've seen, I've seen people's bodies, nothing but the back of their head and their heels touching the ground, coming off the floor. Are you I, in shock? I'm, I'm very surprised. And those people come up, and they have a very significant change in their health. What and makes it work, Joe? I'm going to answer it on two levels, because I want to I be very clear. Uh, there is an absolute physical, scientific explanation to it, right? There is, there is energy that is beginning to create coherent patterns that are literally disorganizing anything incoherent and reorganizing wholeness in the body. We see that. But for the people, the healers, they have to get energy into their heart because that, that's the center where the field begins to sure. expand. They can't be thinking about how long they're doing it. They can't be thinking about my back hurts, am I doing this right? They got to get beyond all of that. They got to connect to that field of information. Right. Now, what makes them get there is the instruction, the repetition, the experience, and a certain level of trust or belief that it's the truth. So. We have to step into the unknown in order for the unknown to happen. And we got to be able to execute with a certain amount of skill, just like any skill you learn, that when it comes time to do this, you have to have certain skill sets in place. And at the same time, you have to trust. And I believe that um, we're witnessing miracles in our workshops that are of biblical proportion. I mean, they, they are really amazing, just powerful uh, miracles. When we wake up in the morning and we 
begin to perceive light. The wavelength of light from mm -hmm. the sun, wavelength from these lights here, uh, signals a nucleus in the brain called the suprachiasmic nucleus, which signals the sympathetic nervous system, signals the pineal gland, and the pineal gland begins to make serotonin, sure. and that's our waking neurotransmitter. Uh, when there's an inhibition of light and it gets dark, the lack of the wavelength of light does the same pattern and all of a sudden serotonin is turned into melatonin right in the pineal gland as well. But the pineal gland has tiny little rhombohedral crystal, uh, cr rhombohedron crystals and they're stacked on top of each other. And those crystals act like a radio receiver, aha. And when the pineal gland gets activated, what it does is it begins to create a resonant field, an invisible field, just like a radio antenna, that can tune in to different frequencies beyond the speed of light. Now, Einstein said e equals mc squared, which means nothing in this three-dimensional reality can travel faster than the speed of light. Anything material that travels faster than the speed of light is going to turn into energy. So the ceiling of this three-dimensional reality is the speed of light. So when the pineal gland gets activated, and it begins to resonate at a frequency faster than light. Now, all of a sudden now, melatonin is going to get an upgrade. And there are derivatives or metabolites, George, of melatonin. And those metabolites produce some of the most powerful antioxidants known to man. Anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial. You take the molecule, you tweak it again, you make a benzodiazepine. What's that? That's Valium. It's going to sedate the analytical mind. It's going to sedate the survival centers. Now, melatonin causes us to relax. You take that molecule, you tweak it again. You have the same chemical found in hibernating animals. No sex drive, no ha. appetite, no, no interest. Shut some down. Yeah, so the body goes into stasis. You take that molecule, you tweak it again. Same chemical found in an electric eel. That's what causes those high amplitudes in the brain. You take the molecule, you tweak it one more time, and you get dimethyltryptamine, the most powerful hallucinogenic known to man. So now, think about this. There are realms that exist. Quantum physics will tell you there's a there's the many worlds theory. There's infinite dimensions that are stacked up on top of each other that, that literally we're living right in one of those, one slice of infinite slices in bread. So then, the moment you begin to tune into a frequency faster than the speed of light, and the pineal gland is resonating with that frequency, what's going to connect the physics of that energy to the biology of our brain? And it's the pineal gland. So the pineal gland takes the input, like, and it's called Powerful. a transducer. They actually call it in medical texts a transducer. What does a transducer do? A transducer is a television antenna. It's going to take a frequency and turn it into a picture. So all of a sudden, once the pineal gland becomes activated and it's picking up that energy, that stream of consciousness right. is going to produce a very profound vision. That's why it's called the third eye. And that vision is going to be more real than you and I sitting here. It's going to be so real that this three-dimensional reality is going to disappear and you're going to be transported to another place. The first thing we do is melatonin levels are at their height between one and four in the morning. Right. So guess when, we start, guess when we start our meditation? That's when the raw material was at its height. And brain waves are just right. You're kind of groggy and you're somewhere between alpha and theta. You don't really care what you look like and you get enough people in the room. And then we go through a, a series of uh, steps to activate it. Now, one of the things that we do is we do this very particular breath. And when we do this breath, what we're doing is we're working on pulling energy from our lower centers all the way up into our brain. And it's a practice. And when we do it, we bring it all the way to the top. We bring it to the top and then we squeeze the, our intrinsic muscles and we just hold our breath. And when we do that, we increase what's called intrathecal pressure. Huh. Now, at the base of the third ventricle sits the pineal gland. When we inhale and we squeeze like that, there's fluid inside this closed system between our brain and our spinal column. The inside, the, inside the skull and the spinal column, sits the brain in the central nervous system and it's bathed in this fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. Now cerebral spinal fluid acts as a way to cushion the brain if there's trauma, it creates buoyancy, it's a conduit for electrical charges. So when we start breathing, we start to accelerate the cerebral spinal fluid. We hold our breath and we squeeze 
we increase intrathecal pressure, we start to put a mechanical stress up against those crystals in the pineal gland. Now, there's research, and I have the articles, that says the pineal gland has piezoelectric properties. Now, what the hell does that mean? Piezoelectric. Take a mechanical stress and turn it into an electric charge. So by applying that stress against the pineal gland, you begin to tap against those crystals and it begins to produce the electrical field. And that field begins to stretch that out as far as it can. When the, when the crystals can't stretch anymore, the field reverses. And when the field reverses, it compresses the crystal again. And when the crystals are compressed, it creates another field. And now you got a little antenna going there. So as you keep practicing this, you keep causing that little gland to become like a radio antenna. That's amazing. And all of a sudden, the person goes super lucid. They go, they go, they have a transcendental moment. And that transcendental moment typically changes them forever. They, How they, could a little gland be so powerful? <laughs> Thank God it's little. Now, well, 80% of the people in the Western world have calcified uh, pineal glands because of fluoride. In fact, the fluoride, oh, really? the negative charge of the fluoride sure. ion uh, binds with the positive calcium uh, crystals. And, and so it kind of tends to create this toothpaste kind of calcification in the pineal gland. And it's a scientific fact the long-term uh, effects of those stress chemicals push the genetic buttons that create disease. And so sooner or later, you got to give that up. Sooner or sure. later, you have to decide that there's another way to live. And people are doing it. And if anybody else can do it, you can do it.